Uh, thank you again, and I'll uh, turn it over to uh, Evan. Thank you, Dean. Uh, how great it is to, uh, to be here in the medical school. Congratulations on uh, having this thing up and running and, um, and, and, and doing all that it's doing for Austin and for Texas. Um, I'm Evan Smith. Uh, as the Dean said, I'm the CEO and co-founder of the Tribune. We're so pleased to be here with a conversation about what repeal and replace means for Texas. And as the panelists know, when we planned this event some six weeks ago, I had some anxiety about whether we would be overtaken by events. Would this be, on the one hand, fixed by now, and so there'd be nothing to talk about? <laughs> some of us were not so concerned about generally, that. Generally speaking, you can always count on that not happening, right? But, um, but in fact, it turns out that just the opposite has been the case. Uh, rather than this event becoming less timely over time, it has become more timely to the point that we may allegedly have, don't know that we will, some discussion of this issue later this week or just after the, uh, we get past this government shutdown deadline into the first part of May, there is going to be a very meaningful discussion about where we head next. And so we are really at exactly the right moment, it turns out, um, to talk about this issue. Today's conversation is one of uh, several that we do over the course of the year, generously supported by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Texas, which supports so many of the Tribune's events. We are here because of their generosity. Please give them a big hand, please. <laughs> Uh, I would also uh, say to the dean and to my old pal, Steve Scheibel, recovering journalist, um, it's like being an alcoholic, uh, <laughs> never X, always recovering, right? Um, Janet Cole, Kim Berger, and Mary Myers, among others at the Dell Medical School, we thank them very much for making it possible for us to uh, be here. I also want to acknowledge uh, other supporters of this event today, Methodist Healthcare Ministries of South Texas, Texas Children's Hospital, the Episcopal Health Foundation, and Southwest Airlines, all generously supporting the Tribune, as well as any of you who are members of the Tribune, you know this is spring membership drive week, and if you're not a member of the Tribune, we'd be happy to have you sign up and become one. It's a great time to do it. Um, this uh, event will go about an hour in total. We'll do about 35 or 40 minutes of conversation on stage. And as the Dean said, when it comes time to bring you all into this conversation and ask questions, rather than have a handheld microphone walked around, which we typically do, here we are at the state-of-the-art Dell Medical School. You'll be able to push the button that says push or some facsimile of push on your, at your seat. <laughs> And you will be amplified for the room, and so we'll ask that you do that. But we'll take as many questions as time permits, have you out if you're at about 9 o'clock. If you tweet this event, the hashtag is TT Events. And let me, with that, introduce our uh, three guests who come to us from think tanks and policy shops on, at different points on the ideological spectrum. Unlike so many of our events on healthcare and other events, rather than have elected officials here, Representative Farabee, we have people who actually know stuff. So that was one, <laughs> that was one big distinction that we made with this event. Under uh, promise and over deliver. I am. Uh, yeah. you no, know, I'm going to over deliver on this. You watch. Uh, on my left is Ann Dunkelberg, uh, who is the associate director of the Center for Public Policy Priorities and the director of its health and wellness program. Before arriving at CPPP in 1994, she was program director for acute care in the Texas Medicaid director's office and spent six years at the Texas Research League writing reports on Texas health and human services issues. She has an undergraduate degree from the University of Texas at Austin and a master's from the LBJ School of Public Affairs at UT Austin. Ovik Roy is president and co-founder of the Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity, a journalist, policy wonk, and political strategist. He's advised three Republican candidates for president, Mitt Romney, Rick Perry, and Marco Rubio. He is an opinion editor at Forbes, managing The Apothecary, a blog on healthcare policy and entitlement reform. And he's the author of two books, How Medicaid Fails the Poor and The Case Against Obamacare. I think he should make those titles a little bit more transparent about what he thinks <laughs> about the issue. Uh, he's a graduate of MIT and of Yale University Medical School. Finally, Chip Roy, director of the Center for the Tenth Amendment Action, Center for Tenth Amendment, Center for Tenth Amendment Action, pardon me, at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, previously served as the first assistant attorney general of Texas under Attorney General Ken Paxton, as chief of staff to U.S. Senator Ted Cruz, and as a senior advisor to Governor Rick Perry, who named him uh, director of state and federal relations for the state of Texas. He has undergraduate and master's degrees from the University of Texas and a law degree from the University of Texas. Please, I'm sorry, undergraduate and master's degree from the University of Virginia and a law degree from the <laughs> University of Texas. Please join me in welcoming right. Ann Dunkelberg, Ovik Roy, and Chip Roy. So um, I, want, I want to begin with the premise of this conversation, which is that there will be repeal and replace. 
and whether repeal and replace will be good for Texas. Before we get to a place where we can discuss what it would mean for Texas, let's dial this back a little bit and talk about whether repeal and replace is a good thing uh, at all. And that really gets us to whether the Affordable Care Act has been good or bad for Texas. We know what the stats are. Before the Affordable Care Act, there were 25% of Texans without health insurance, about 6 million. Today, it's 17.1%, I believe, by the last numbers, and 4.6 million. So the rate of the uninsured has declined. Whatever that means for health care, the rate of the uninsured has declined. And you're kind of out on a limb here. It's sort of two against one as, as it relates I to, this, I noticed that. to this question. I, I told them it's not a fair fight. You can take them both probably. Um, <laughs> I know you. Uh, uh, could, could you make the argument, would you make the argument, uh, something I believe you believe, which is that this is by the by been good for Texas, the Affordable Care Act? Yes, it's been good for Texas. It could have been a whole lot better. Um, there are things that, uh, Congress needs to fix about the Affordable Care Act, and some of those we would agree on. You some stipulate it's not perfect. Absolutely yeah. imperfect. Right. We knew it was imperfect when the ink was drying on the, on the bill. Uh, and obviously, you know, it's sort of a glaring problem in Texas that we left uh, our so working poor and just above the poverty line families without any access to subsidies in the marketplace. Uh, and also without a Medicaid option. So right. we've, we missed an opportunity to cover a whole lot more people and also take a, a lot of pressure off of our safety net, especially right. the hospitals. But seven plus years in, life in Texas and Texans are better for it than not. I would say so. In your mind. Chip, you worked for Governor Perry, did you not, at, at, at the time that the Affordable Care Act was signed? Uh, just after. Just, just after. So the, the decision was made by Texas, not just no, but hell no, to buying into the Affordable Care Act, to expanding Medicaid and all that. Take us back to the thought process that went into that decision and why you think it was the right decision then and now. Sure, um, you know, at the time, obviously there was a great deal of concern about Obamacare and, and um, I do think there'd be some general agreements on some of the things where the shortfalls and there'd be some disagreements. Um, but there was concerns about what it would mean in terms of uh, costs for uh, folks by insurance, what it would mean for premiums. And then with respect to Medicaid, there was a lot of concern in the governor's office about what, what would Texas be left holding at the end of the, the rainbow, right? So when we talked about, the, well, our coverage on that would be max 10% under the Obamacare law, uh, our concern was that those costs would continue to explode and at the end that law would change and Texas is the one left holding the bag at the end right. uh, and absorbing all of the costs. So whatever money was to come back from Washington to Texas, that was going to be a finite stream of dollars and that in the end we would be left with this big bill. Right, and keep yeah. in mind that right now, I mean, what, $26 billion of our annual budget is Medicaid and uh, we continue to have a continued uh, consumption of the Texas budget with respect to Medicaid right. and demanding more and more Texas resources as well. And so the concern was don't go and embrace that uh, as I think Governor Perry put it at the time, just shuffling the uh, uh, deck chairs around on the Titanic, right? right. And, and don't, don't go down that road. So that was the thinking at the time. And you ultimately go to work from Rick Perry, you go to work for Ted Cruz who becomes more than anybody else the living embodiment of we need to get rid of Obamacare. And there it was as much about the things as you said as it was also about constitutional principles, the idea that somehow Washington should not be dictating to Texas how health care should go. Yeah, that's right. I mean, and, and you know, a lot of a lot of was made of, of you know that very quiet time in 2013 when I was Senator Cruz's chief of staff. <laughs> very quiet. Uh, time, very right. quiet time. Unassuming. Yeah. Uh, and you know, in the fall of 13, he obviously uh, raised this as a significant issue. And I, look, I mean, I think some amount of, of history now has been has borne out some of the things that Senator Cruz is arguing. You talk about the constitutional principles. One of my famous de favorite debates on the floor of the Senate. I mean, there aren't that many debates on the floor of the Senate, sadly. But one of my favorite debates was in the middle of the night that night during the filibuster when Senator Lee and Senator Cruz were down there for about three hours talking about con the constitutional principles uh, surrounding this. And and. Um, at the end of the day, what we've seen since then, we've seen now the full implementation, and now we're seeing the, the results of that, which I know we'll get to in a little bit, yeah. but the premium's increasing, and we're seeing the effect on Texas, notwithstanding the coverage numbers going up as a result of the individual mandate and other factors. Um, we're seeing now premiums going up. We're seeing insurance insurers leave the market. We've got 50 or 60 some odd counties in Texas that only have one insurer, one insurer right. uh, and we're seeing those continue to drop, and that's that's part of the problem. Um, uh, Ovik, you have an inter you occupy an interesting place along this continuum because while you have had very critical things say about the Affordable Care Act, you worked for 
Mitt Romney, who is said to have been, in some respects, the grandfather of this. Before there was Obamacare, there was Romney care. You know that that's a facile description of what actually happened, but it is often said that Mitt Romney planted the seeds that ultimately sprouted into the Affordable Care Act. Uh, well, to be clear, I didn't work for Mitt Romney in Massachusetts. Then, no, no, but I worked, worked for, for him in 2012. But you worked for a guy who at least is associated with yeah. what became the, the basis. For and it. what's interesting is I had actually written a number of, uh, of columns at Forbes at the time criticizing Romney Care and some of the premises behind it because right. it actually drove up the cost of health insurance in Massachusetts, and they right. still hired me anyway, which so, is very so much to So you were a Romneyite, but you were not a Romney Careite. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and what, what, what's, your, what's your view of what, of what we've seen over the last seven years, good or bad, worth keeping or not? Well, first let me just say that uh, my dad was on the faculty of the UT Medical School in San Antonio, so I've followed the, the dream of, of building this campus for many, many years, so it's really great to be here, my first official event at the Dell Medical School, and good. so thank you very much for, uh, for having us here yeah. today, and congratulations yeah. on getting this place uh, going. Um, you know, uh, there was a comment earlier that, well, everybody knew what was wrong with Obamacare in 2010 when it passed, so nothing that's happened in the last seven years has been surprising. Um, I would completely disagree with that, that statement. Uh, when I was Which writing I in 2011, 2012, <laughs> yeah. that the ACA was going to drive up, uh, significantly drive up the cost of health insurance for people who bought it on their own in places like Texas, uh, Paul Krugman wrote in his New York Times column that I was a liar and a fraud. Ezra Klein, Jonathan Gohan, the, all the leading lights of the liberal healthcare commentary were accusing me of dishonesty. And all I was doing was looking at the actual regulations, their economic effect, and the actual filings by insurance companies declaring what their premiums were going to be uh, once the ACA went into effect. So I was using actual data to just point out, here's what they're saying the premiums are going to be, here's what they were last year. Um, and no one else was bothering to do that kind of work. And lo and behold, uh, it's turned out, now everyone understands that the ACA has driven up the cost of health insurance right. uh, quite a bit. Uh, another thing that, that really made my name in the space, because I've only been doing this kind of work for about six, seven years. I used to be uh, a biotechnology investor in New York before I started doing this work. Uh, the other thing I used to talk about a lot was, as you alluded to in your introduction, Medicaid's poor health outcomes. The fact is that Medicaid, in most parts of the country, uh, a lot of physicians don't take it because Medicaid pays so much less than what private insurers pay. And the reason for that disparity is that the structure of Medicaid basically gives states no other way to balance their Medicaid budgets except to pay hospitals and doctors less for the same amount of care. And so over the five decades of the program, there's been this increasing disparity, widening disparity between what uh, Medicaid pays doctors and hospitals and what private insurers pay. And as a result, a lot of people don't take Medicaid. And as a result of that, if you are enrolled in Medicaid, you don't get the access to let alone primary care, also specialty care that you need to, to manage your health. So the health outcomes for people on Medicaid are no better than those for people with no insurance at all. So we can talk all we want about the statistics of people who are covered. And I'm an unusual bird, that I'm a conservative who believes in universal coverage. And I've, one of the books you didn't mention was a publication we put out at this new Austin-based think tank, the Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity, that's about a conservative case for universal coverage. But the way to do that is not through expanding Medicaid. It's through giving people more control of their own health care dollars to yeah. buy the health insurance and health care that they want. That's not what the ACA does. Why, why is it, before we come back to Ann on some of the criticisms <laughs> of the Affordable Care Act, why is it that you say the, yes, coverage numbers are up, but is the fact that coverage numbers are up not a good in and of itself? Do we misunderstand? A be, a, that, that gr greater coverage is not as good as it appears to be? All things being equal, more coverage is better than less coverage. But all things are not equal, right? So if, if you're covering, if you have this piece of paper that says you have health insurance, but that piece of paper doesn't give you access to primary care. Coverage is not care. Exactly, and not only is coverage not care, but if the cost of that coverage is so high that you've effectively priced other people, what the ACA did for people who are buying coverage on these exchanges, like healthcare.gov, yeah. is it said for some people who are uh, relatively older and relatively sick, we're gonna heavily subsidize coverage for you, or if you're relatively poor, close to the poverty line in your income. But for people who are the working poor, the people making three times the poverty line, four times the poverty line, who are maybe a little younger, they're being priced out of the market. So what the ACA said is we're gonna take 
three quarters of the people who are uninsured and drive up the cost for them so that one quarter of the people who are uninsured have lower costs. And that's why you see this situation where on the exchanges in 2010, the Congressional Budget Office projected that 25 million people would be enrolled in the exchanges. Only 11 million are today, and that number may decline as we go forward because the premiums right. keep going up. And do you stipulate any of these? Will you, will you accept the criticisms of? Oh, gosh, I'm, uh, I wasn't taking notes, so I'm sure I have a number of things I'd like to respond to. Right. One would be I, I went back and looked at notes from the work I was doing in 2008 and 2009 for perspective, and one of the things in 2008, before Congress you know, had started working on this legislation, one of the things that we were saying uh, here in Texas is, you know, what are the things that we want out of health reform as Congress starts doing this? And one of the things we said was, we want health care that is available and affordable no matter what your income level is, which doesn't mean it's free, but it's affordable. Uh, and one of the stipulations we said to that is that doesn't mean we're going to shrink the health care. There's two ways to do that. You can, you can uh, designate a minimum standard of care and make sure you have a subsidy structure that's adequate to make that possible, or you can shrink the amount of health care that's available to people based on their income. And unfortunately, the latest uh, proposals from Congress seem to be going with that second Ladder, scenario. Yeah. Yes, um, so that would be one thing. And, and another thing I saw in 2009, as they were already debating pieces of legislation, was we were already concerned that in an effort to hit an arbitrary kind of price target for the ACA, they were already undermining the ability of the ACA to give the kind of support all the way through the middle class, especially lower income middle class folks, that it was really going to need. It was obvious that far back that there were, they were creating cliffs. And I certainly agree with Mr. Roy that, that that is not a good idea. It's not a great idea when subsidies in the marketplace work phenomenally well for people up to about 250% of poverty, and then folks start to fall off a cliff and they are understandably annoyed. What about the premiums question? The both, premiums, both, both, both well, one of the things about the premiums is, I think we have to remember that yeah. the individual marketplace, which you get both through healthcare.gov or directly from an insurer, in Texas is 8% of the market. And we have some serious issues with that marketplace. And it would be, but 8% of Texans are in that marketplace. So it's important to understand that we shouldn't spend this whole hour talking about premiums in that marketplace, even though it's hugely important to the people who need coverage there, and it does need to be fixed. Um, I think that everybody here knows that there are a number of provisions designed to increase or uh, react to risk selection issues, adverse selection, that have been undermined by Congress since then. So that part of the problem, obviously, is that at no time since the passage of the ACA have we had a Congress that was interested in actually repairing it, only repealing it. So that's been one of the problems. Um, I think, uh, you know, we, we, the stats are out. There have been a lot of reports just in the last couple of months on what's happening with premiums. Uh, we know that a number of players came into that market with no idea what cost to expect because the individual marketplace in Texas was completely unregulated before the ACA. And so anyone could be charged anything, anyone could be denied. And so essentially these insurers were having to figure out how to price coverage for people that they previously would have just completely turned down. So they didn't have a track record of what it was gonna cost. So there's a lot of complications to that. So I would in no way disagree that there are serious issues with stability of this small individual market that is nevertheless very important and we need to take care of them, but they are fixable. And, and, and to suggest that they aren't, you know, is, is just wrong. And I, I'm sorry, but yeah. I have to, since, since there was a long treatise on Medicaid, I have to jump back in and Please. say, I uh, certainly agree, and in 1990, you know, when I was barely out of grad school, wrote a report on physician participation and access to care in Texas Medicaid. It's a huge issue. But what I've also seen in the last 20 plus years at the center, and I don't know, I, you know, I think your observation that the structure of Medicaid put, makes it the easiest way to economize in it to cut provider rates. That's absolutely true, and people on both sides of the issue would, would agree with you on that. I think the other thing you have to observe about Texas is that virtually every session uh, for the last two and a half decades, uh, we've had leadership whose primary goal was to 
past tax cuts. And so, so Texas, I couldn't even tell you how big a number we would have if we rolled back all the tax cuts going back to Governor Perry, if we didn't have the tax cuts that we took just in 2013 and 2015, we would have had $10 billion more billion to allocate this session, irrespective of any issues with oil and gas. And, then the, and, and we are looking at uh, a legislature that's talking about passing legislation that could completely phase out our only business tax, which is worth about $8 billion. So another, another number of billion dollars. So, yeah. so part of the problem with, I mean, the thing that states don't most like about Medicaid, Medicaid is not distinctly different from the rest of the healthcare marketplace. Its per capita costs have grown more slowly than the rest of the healthcare marketplace, largely because of starving provider payments in certain segments. Um, but uh, states you know, don't have to pay for Medicare, states don't have to pay for the rest of our insurance, so they, they tend to treat Medicaid as though it has worse, a worse problem. And our Texas legislature has pressed down on per capita costs in Medicaid uh, relentlessly, you know, going back to at least 2000, if not earlier, so that the actual per capita cost, if you adjust for inflation, is lower than it was in 2000. Uh, Chip, this is an interesting question, because I think there's actually some agreement here about some of the issues at the center of this. The question is, did we give this enough of a chance? You know, one, one way to think about it is we pass the Affordable Care Act. At the national level, we have 70 votes, 65 votes, 80 votes to repeal. There's not really much of a stomach for much of the Obama years to, in Congress to either make this work or to fix what's broken. And in Texas, there was a decision made, as we talked about, to not embrace uh, the uh, aspects of the Affordable Care Act, not even to set up a state exchange to do things like not fund reimbursement rates to the point that new patients were taken by as many doctors as might have been taken. And at the end of the day, Texas then pronounces this whole thing to have not been successful when Texas may have set out from the very beginning to ensure that it wasn't. Is there an argument to be made for us complaining that the Affordable Care Act has not worked the way we wanted it to because we made sure it didn't? Well, if I'm gonna put my cynical hat on, yeah. um, as I'm loath to do, as you know. Yeah. Uh, if I'm going to put my cynical hat on, I would say uh, that there were certainly a lot of discussions in 2008 and 2009 about what a death spiral might look like in Obamacare. Right. Those who are studying what the likely costs were going to be, um, people who were writing about it at the time. Yeah. And so some might question whether the very proponents of the bill knew full well how this was going to play out and were fully comfortable with that, okay. given where that might lead us with respect to needing to step in and what that might take us to single payer. Now, that's a more cynical view. Um, what I would uh, also, going back to some of the comments made earlier, I do think it'd be interesting to talk to some of the insurance companies and ask them uh, a little side note, by the way, about ask their lawyers. Uh, how much they were billing for complying with the regulations that didn't exist in 2007 and 2008. I mean, that, that was, uh, I think, sort of a stunning comment, right? Yeah. And saying that we were in a total Wild West, unregulated environment in 2008 is just just not true, right? And that's one of those things that, I mean, Ovik should talk more than I should about this because he's written uh, lots about it. But the idea that we've even had a free market in this country in healthcare for, uh, right. I mean, uh, years back is, 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 a, is a misstatement and it's a gross mischaracterization and it uh, I think undermines what we're trying to talk about. We're trying to talk about getting competition back into the marketplace. Oh, we've got good ideas on how to do that and there's some disagreements on our side of the aisle on that, but um, I think that's an important part of this. Um, if you'd look at Medicaid broadly and whether or not Texas was right or wrong on, getting, uh, on expanding it, you know, right now, if you go look around the country and you look at the vast majority of the numbers that President Obama and his former administration are out saying are so great about upwards of 20 million people being added, you know, 14 million of those are crammed into Medicaid, right? And Medicaid wasn't designed to be a healthcare delivery system. It was a welfare system designed to be a safety net. And it was supposed to be a joint effort with states to do that. And you've got now 14 million crammed into there. A lot of these folks are able-bodied folks that have been pushed into there. And you look at Illinois, for example, and our sister think tank in Illinois, they did a report recently that 750 some odd people last year died on waiting lists, waiting for care. Uh, because they're getting crowded out by folks who are able-bodied. In other words, this was a, uh, a, a flawed model from the get-go yeah. where you have so many people being shoved into Medicaid in that way. Um, and so I think that there uh, were a lot of considerations going to what Texas wanted to do to make sure that Texas wasn't 
basically, as I said before, jumping on the Titanic and end up leaving us in a worse financial position in the end when this wasn't going to work. Uh, Ovik, you have, uh, and by you I mean conservatives, have a majority in the House, have a majority in the Senate. You elected somebody who ran expressly for the purpose of repealing and replacing, I think at one point he maybe said on day one, right? Now discovers that healthcare is complicated, but that's okay. Um, um, wh what happened? I, mean, I, I assume that the zeal was there. I mean, we can argue about what happened over our shoulders, but looking ahead, the zeal was there to, to get rid of this. I would note that Ovik and I are 0 and 5 for our presidential campaign advisory. <laughs> so you know. I'm going to look. I'm going to look past your one loss record as far as that goes. What? 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 what why? What has happened? Where? If, if this discussion were taking place, say two years ago, and I told you in two years you're going to have control of both houses of Congress and the White House, the assumption would have been that all the problems you identified would be gone because you're just going to race to get this thing overturned. That would not have been my assumption because healthcare is complicated. Yeah. Um, but uh, you, you, didn't, you didn't think politically you were going to be able to solve this problem. No, I, I think I think there are solutions. There are, you know, again, we've, we've developed a lot of, I think, credible, gradual ways to reform the system in a better direction. Um, the challenge with healthcare is several fold. Um, first, if, if Republicans do have a majority in Congress and they have the White House, but they don't have 60 seats in the Senate. Democrats had 60 seats in the Senate. That allowed them to pass stuff that was filibuster proof in a way that Republicans don't. Republicans are constrained by the fact they only have 52 seats in the Senate, right. which means they can pass things through the Senate's reconciliation process, which purely is required to be used for taxing and spending, fiscal policy, not for regulatory policy. A lot of things that we've been talking about in terms of the premiums going up on, under Obamacare, that's driven by regulation, and you not by fix, taxing you and spending. You could not fix that under reconciliation. You can, you, can, you can tweak it, but you can't really make dramatic changes. So you know, one thing that you know, you've been saying repeal and replace a lot. I think it's very important for people to understand that while this process is very partisan in Washington, it was for Obamacare, it is currently, the actual ideological content of the policy uh, that Republicans are, are putting forward is much more a reform of the ACA. Now you can right. debate whether or not you agree with the reforms in that bill, but it's not a repeal and replace. I think you and Chip would agree with that. In effect, from Chip's perspective, that's the problem, right? That it's yeah, not a repeal. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I completely agree. So, so, in fact, we talk about repeal and replace, which has come to mean. Yeah, it's, it's, it's become, moved, it's, it's yeah, beyond repeal Obamacare. and replace has become right. kind of a buzz phrase for something that isn't right. technically a repeal and replace. It's more, it's, it's, it repeals significant parts of the law. It repeals almost all the tax hikes in Obamacare, for example. It mostly repeals the ACA's Medicaid expansion, but it replaces it with something else. It mostly replaces the subsidies for the exchange-based plan, but then replaces it with something else. So if you look at the sum total, the end result is something more center-right than repeal, take everything out right. by the roots, and then And, and, then and where you stand as far as this new plan, the plan that the Ryan, Ryan and company essentially were pushing a couple of weeks ago with the White House kind of sort of on board and sort of not, and where we're heading in the next couple of weeks, you are generally speaking for it. Well, I wrote a piece for Forbes when the bill first dropped saying that other than the fact that it would price millions of people out of their health insurance, it's a great bill. Right. And I didn't mean that sarcastically, actually, in the sense that there are a lot of important reforms in this bill, particularly on the Medicaid, the legacy Medicaid program, the traditional yeah. Medicaid program, that will make that program much more fiscally sustainable and give states that flexibility that instead of just cutting rates to doctors and hospitals, they can actually manage their programs in ways that reflect yeah. the populations and needs of their states. So I think there's a lot of really important stuff on the Medicaid side, uh, but in terms of achieving the goal of covering more people or a same number of people in a more market-oriented way, the bill fails at that because the structure of the tax credits yeah. in Ryan Care uh, is not adequate to the job. And so you, uh, ultimately, if, if you were in Congress yourself having to vote on this, you would vote no on the plan No, I, well, you know, uh, when people have asked me, I said I would vote yes in the hopes that, that you know, because the Medicaid piece is so important and so significant. Yeah. Uh, but, but work hard to reform the exchange or individual market piece of it with the Senate. So uh, I would say there's a lot of problems with this bill. Uh, I've been a vocal critic of the things about the bill that I, I think are problematic. But, not, but nominally for it. But on balance, I think right. I would vote yes. Chip, you're a hell no. You're not just a no, you're a hell no. <laughs> I think it's a fair statement. You have a piece on foxnews.com today, an opinion piece that says basically what I asked you about earlier. This is not just about health care. This is about 
foundational constitutional principles that we're not really seeing how, how significant this would, would or would not be, depending upon how this goes. Yeah, I mean, sure, the point that I was trying to make in this was just simply that, it, and this goes to the heart, this is more po a political statement than it is a comment on the policy and the right. healthcare uh, policy, but that what we're seeing right now with the failure in Washington, in my opinion, a failure with Republicans, they're basically taking a, a bill that they criticized for four election cycles for seven years that was built on the back of regulations, of subsidies, and on Medicaid expansion, and they've put forward a bill that is essentially regulations, um, subsidies, and Medicaid expansion. Now, you can talk about the different flavors of Only with fewer people them. covered in the end, as Ovik says. I, I think that's right, and I think that um, it, but you've got expanded subsidies, but they look different, and, and so we can get into all the weeds on that, but my point is, it's not a markedly different thing. So, I mean, it really isn't to repeal and replace, and so politically, I have real trouble with that Republican Party, and they're out trying to sell something they're not doing. Yeah. In my opinion, they're being completely disingenuous. And in your mind, Chip, it would be better to leave the thing that you hate so much in place than pass something that at least attempts to get at some of this stuff. I do not believe that, that it's a good thing for the party that stands in theory, right. and I stress in theory, for free markets, free enterprise, right. and for uh, limited government and for federalism to go forward and push forward a bill that really doesn't do any of those things. Do you ever things. think you'd be saying the words, I'd prefer Obamacare to blank? <laughs> well, I don't, ref I don't prefer Obamacare. You were Obamacare. like the last person on earth I thought would ever say those words. Right. Well, I'm not saying that I prefer Obamacare. What I prefer is honesty in right. policymaking. Um, Republicans aren't really, in my opinion, being honest about it. And, you know, the result of that is that, in my opinion, we're failing, we Republicans, we conservatives in particular, are failing to win the minds and hearts of a new generation of Americans to actually believe in the principles of limited government, of capitalism, of free markets, right. and of, of the things that I believe got us. Yeah to the country. Quick, country quickly, now. isn't it possible that maybe the reason this is not happening the way you want is because ultimately it's not the right thing? And that people in Congress and people back home have said basically, you know what, in the end we don't want to repeal. In the end we don't want to go to a free market system because we're too concerned about what the impact of it would be. I think that it's uh, currently failing because the leadership in Washington has not put forward a remotely viable plan it's not and explained bold it. It's not, well, they're not actually getting forward and leading with something, right? I mean, you get, there was a call on Saturday where they're talking about their plans for this week. You've alluded to whether or not there's a deal, and we can get right. into that in a minute. But essentially, it was all about, well, there's a thing and we need to do it. We need to do something. We have to do something, right? And that does not produce good policy. Yeah. Right, and we, we're seeing a lot of the same things that happened to Obamacare in 2008 and 2009 resurfacing. The very things that Republicans criticized, right. jamming a bill through that you hadn't read, trying to push it through without having all the votes figured out, not going out and doing town halls and messaging and explaining to people. Right. The main core yeah, by, problem- And by the way, one party. And, yeah. and well, and that point- Which part, is the worst which, part. Which was about Obamacare yeah. was a single party bill, right? right? Jammed through literally on party, party lines. And so now we're seeing a lot of the same thing. And you can't have something that restructures one fifth of the economy and touches every single American the way that it does with respect to healthcare and do it on a purely partisan, partisan basis. Right. And the problem is, in my opinion, Republicans aren't winning the message. They aren't making the argument to go win minds and hearts. Right. Let me uh, just jump in quickly. <laughs> I, want, I want to go to Anna. No. Yeah. Okay, let me quickly go to Anna. I'll come right back. So uh, your chip is hell no. You're also hell no, but for different reasons. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Explain I, what this would mean for all of us. Well, I think everybody understands that you know the challenge for the Republicans is that they do include people who agree with Chip, but they also include people who actually think there is an appropriate role for government in making affordable health care available to everyone. I don't think all the Republicans are just scared of backlash. I think some of them actually believe Medicare should exist and that the free market left to its own devices will not distribute healthcare uh, adequately to the people. Uh, and, and this is just one area where if we want low income Americans in Texas to have healthcare and we want them to have a decent standard of it, the yeah. only way to do that is to have some sort of structure that Texas would be worse would be worse for what Chip and yes, the current, are the current proposal guts the subsidy structure. It completely takes away all of the income basis for it so that a family of four earning $25,000 would get the exact same premium tax credit or subsidy as a family of four earning $100,000. It also, and this is one of the problems with the Medicaid proposal, it, it, it looks back at 2016 and freezes in for Texas 
decades of bad decisions or decisions that were not particularly carefully or strategically thought out about our Medicaid program, like uh, cutting pediatric therapy rates, which we did in 2015, like not covering hep C life-saving medication or the state-of-art treatment for autism for kids. Right. All of those things would be baked into a 26 basis. But it also, we also have the, the problem uh, that you have uh, states spending wildly different amounts on Medicaid, so $4,000 per person in Medicaid in one state, up to $10,000 in another. So this, this solution proposes to freeze all that in place and doesn't give states a lot of, of latitude to maybe go back and try to do things more thoughtfully in their Medicaid program. On the, on the premium side, on the, on the marketplace side, we have another bizarre outcome of our healthcare system, which I do not endorse and needs to be fixed, but we have the situation where a 60-year-old woman, sorry about that, a 60-year-old woman in Wichita Falls, Texas, uh, would be paying, uh, her, her premium would be about $17,000 a year, the full cost premium for her coverage. And right now, she's getting a $15,000 subsidy if she's living on about uh, $30,000 $30, a year. And that would drop to f from $15,000 to $4,000 under this. So the bottom line is there's a huge reduction in the amount of money that goes into the premium subsidies right. under this bill. Not only that, but what's left is being directed to a whole lot of people who don't get it today and don't need it. And I think this is one of the things that Ovik and I agree on, that it was just a bizarrely structured. Uh, so the same premium subsidy if I live in Waco or San Francisco, uh, so it just it, it is uh, it, it completely removes the flawed principle that was baked into yeah. the ACA, which is we want to figure out a way to say everybody has to put up X percent of their income towards your health care. But once you hit that, we're going to step in and help you with it. And and it's flawed in that, like I said, people fall off a cliff somewhere between right. 250 and 300 percent of poverty. But this proposal would completely gut that. Uh, in addition to freezing <coughs> state Medicaid programs and cutting cutting existing programs in Medicaid, we don't even have time to go into all those details. Oh, you've heard the criticism from, in essence, the left and the right, right? What do you say? Well. Uh, I agree with parts of both, and I disagree with parts of both. Yeah. I mean, I definitely agree, and I've written extensively at freeopt.org, our think tank's website, about this problem of the subsidies and how the structure of the subsidies yeah. will throw a lot of people off their health insurance unnecessarily without really saving a lot of money to the system. So I think that is a significant problem. I would disagree with the idea that uh, free markets can't deliver health care to people. I mean, we're in the Dell Medical School, which is named after one of the great innovators uh, of the technology sector right. that brought uh, personal computing to almost every American at of a time it is when a public university. Well, well, yes, of course, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, and there should be there's an appropriate role for public universities, right. but it's also heavily supported by. Uh, private innovators, and private innovators have driven this economy in Austin, and let's just make this point again more broadly, what, why is it that everyone today has a smartphone in their pocket? It's not because the government created a smartphone factory and then uh, paid for everyone's cell phone contract to buy them a smartphone. Right? It's because innovators had an incentive to make those smartphones or laptops yeah. or computers, in the case of Dell, cheaper and more accessible to more people. And the reason why healthcare in America is so expensive is because we've done the opposite of that. We've subsidized it for everyone without having any thought to the cost or the efficiency. So you can go the single payer route and restrain costs and restrain access and control price. That's one intellectually coherent way to do it. But free markets are the other, and we haven't tried either. What we've done is crony capitalism, where we subsidize uh, big hospitals like this one um, uh, to, and let them charge whatever they want and Medicare will pay the bill um, and taxpayers are, end up with right. the bill later on. So, so that's, that's a problem. And one thing I'll disagree slightly with Chip and we agree on many things philosophically is I think he's being a little tough on the Republicans when he says they're being dishonest about what they're proposing. They are constrained by the Senate reconciliation process. Now there are some people who argue that you can repeal all of Obamacare. The, 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 the idea that you need eight Democrats to support anything that comes over from the House, therefore you've got to make consent to yeah, I mean, so, so my, my whole argument for the last four or five years has been the way to bring Republicans and, uh, and Democrats together is to, yeah. for conservatives to embrace the goal of universal coverage, but for uh, Democrats to embrace the goal of doing it through more market-oriented mechanisms. That's sort of the way to bridge Tra the partisan divide. Right. Uh, 
side. Um, but Republicans did not decide to go that path. They decided to go the more partisan path, and that has limited their policy options because right. you can only do certain things through reconciliation. Chip, as a, as a practical matter, there are aspects of the Affordable Care Act that are popular in red states and in blue states. And one of the discussions about the so-called essential, not so-called, they're literally called essential health benefits, <laughs> literally called essential health benefits, is that there are things in there that if they were to be at issue in any kind of reform or replace plan, people back home in Republican areas in red states might object. One of those is pre-existing conditions. Mm -hmm. Now, you, are, you would bring this up yourself. You bring it up when we're together all the time and talk about the fact that you are a cancer survivor. You understand the concept as well as anybody might up on a panel like this of what pre-existing conditions might mean as a ding against the ability to get access to coverage. That is one of the hot potatoes in this conversation we're having just this week, that pre-existing conditions are, are left in the plan, but I guess it's the McCarthy Amendment, would allow MacArthur. states to, pardon me? Tom MacArthur. 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 MacArthur Amendment, MacArthur Amendment, pardon me, would, 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 uh, would allow for states to seek a waiver to get rid of pre-existing conditions in exchange for making high-risk pools available to people who would otherwise not have access mm -hmm. to coverage. So what do you think about that, or the idea of being able to leave your 26-year-old uh, child on parents' health insurance? That's also popular in not just blue areas of the country, but red areas. What about that stuff? Sure, I mean, you just rattled off a lot of things, yeah. which we could talk about for an hour, yeah. just in and of itself. But uh, sort of in, in order, if I remember your question, Pre-existing conditions, yes. Um, six years ago, a tickle in my throat turned into Hodgkin's lymphoma. And I um, you know, went to MD Anderson, and I've been blessed to be cancer-free for about five years. And, and um, as a part, in significant part, due to uh, pharmaceutical companies producing some great drugs that I yep. was on. I was on a trial study down in, in, in Houston and uh, took Nulasta for white blood cells, you know, the, and uh, so I'm, I'm a big believer in what the free market medicine, wh what it can produce. Obviously, MD Anderson's a, a, a University of Texas uh, hospital. Um, and so, yeah, I get pre-existing conditions. I've been paying, until recently, I was paying about $2,000 a month for COBRA after having left the state employment last spring and working in political world. And, and so um, I get what, it, you know, what that looks like. Um, my perspective on it, though, is, is simply that if you're going to have a system where you have insurance, if you're not going to have single payer, you're going to have a private market out there with insurance, and you're going to tell the insurance companies that they have to take people with pre-existing conditions, and particularly take them without being able to price through community rating and, and so forth, it's no longer insurance. I mean, it's just, you can call it whatever you want to call it, but it ain't insurance. And so if you're going to try to keep premiums down and have the kind of competition you need and the options you want to have in the marketplace, you can't go out there and say, okay, insurance company, you must take so-and-so regardless of pre-existing conditions and not factor in what that does to the insurance market and what it does to competition. That's my concern. And it re relates to the essential uh, health benefits and the other regulations, including pre-existing conditions, that's, I think, one of the fundamental problems we have with what the Republicans are doing. You know, they took away the individual mandate, they took away the employer mandate as sort of these, you know, uh, uh, things that were driving uh, conservatives and libertarians crazy with respect to being told by government, you must go buy insurance. Okay, well, I didn't like that either as a sort of libertarian-leaning conservative. But frankly, if you're going to take something away, I would have taken that away last compared to leaving in the regulations that are driving up the cost. In other words, in my opinion, they've got it backwards in the sense that they're taking away the mandate, which is part of the financial underpinning, and then they're coming around and they're saying, oh, we're going to leave all these regulations in place that are driving the costs up and that yeah. you can't keep the premiums down. Um, as it relates to the politics, I'll say one slight disagreement with Ovik. I'm one of those that believes you can repeal this through the reconciliation process, uh, that when you talk about something having a non-incidental budgetary impact, that certainly the, regu the, the regulations we're talking about driving up the cost of healthcare have a non-incidental budgetary impact, which is what the standard would be for a ruling of the chair and the parliamentarian and the Senate to be able to say, this is something you can repeal through the reconciliation of the budget process, which only requires a majority in the Senate. Reasonable people can disagree on that, but I believe it's something that can be repealed. Do you think that would be political nuclear war, uh, Armageddon, if you did that, if you if you use reconciliation, that the Democrats are basically going to, any chance of there being any cooperation on any issue going forward is dead? Well, what, what I would hope you would do through this process is use reconciliation to repeal Obamacare per massive numbers of campaign pledges, by the way. Right. 
and then sit down at the table and repeal it for a date certain in the future, right? I mean, you're, you don't want to pull the rug out from under people now, but you repeal it for a date certain in the future and say, all right, guys, so now we need to sit down and work through a health care reform Vote for proposal. a repeal, but delay right. throwing people That was the, the original picture. plan. Yeah. Right. And it should be just that. And that's where, for me, I don't want to be nibbling around the edges yeah. trying to fix a bill that I think is fundamentally flawed. Repeal it for a date certain in the future and then sit down and start figuring out how to get it reformed. We're going to go to questions in a, in a minute, but I want to ask, do you think anything passes? Are you optimistic politically? Uh, I, <laughs> two different questions. Um, do I think something passes? Uh, this week, I do not believe they're going to push a vote on the floor this week based on the latest intelligence of where yeah. things stand in terms of vote counting. Um, and I think, frankly, it's, you know, for the much maligned uh, House Freedom Caucus that has been, you know, bashed over the head for the last several weeks, uh, frankly, by a lot of Republicans, they've been working hard to try to get to a solution, especially over the Easter recess. And in fact, so much so that people like me are pretty critical of it, right? And to your point about the waivers, I think essentially what they're trying to push at the moment is, is optional partial repeal, right? And you're going to be forcing a whole lot of pressure on states to do the very things you were talking about and going and trying to peel these popular benefits as right. opposed to sitting down and producing a plan that will work across the country without, it's, it's sort of fake federalism, right. which I've so written about separately. Week. Nothing this I don't think anything this week. Ovik, do you think something passes? I think there's a 60% chance that something eventually gets out of the House and probably a 20% chance that something eventually gets to the president's I, desk. I agree with that as an yeah. overall view. Yeah. So, so a one in five chance of this even happening at all. Look, health care reform is hard. Democrats tried for 52 years, to, right. or 45 years, I guess, depending on where we start the clock, to pass you know, right. some sort of national health insurance plan, failed yeah. many times, and there was a lot of investment intellectually and politically to get to what we now know of right. as Obamacare. Republicans had not done any of that work, really, prior to this year. There have been a little bit of it in the think tank community, maybe in some, of the, in some of the meetings in Washington. But this goes to your question before, why do Republicans disagree on how to go forward? A big part of the reason why is that structurally, there are several different kinds of Republicans. And I don't mean that ideologically, actually, I mean it in a slightly different way. There are the Republicans who come from districts where everyone is either employed or old, and therefore the government's already spending $1.3 trillion a year subsidizing health insurance for old people under Medicare and employed people under the tax break for employer-based coverage. So if you're in a district like that, the health care system is doing great. And all yep. your, your constituents think that too. Um, so there's a group of, a, a large group of Republicans who just don't care about health care because it's not a problem for their constituents. Then there's a group that's more wonky that cares about the deficit and constitutional and freedom type stuff. And then there's a group uh, that cares perhaps more that has a lot of uninsured people in their districts or, or states that want to really do something. So there the, are these different, these different groups of policymakers with different concerns bubbling up from their voters. Yep. And I think that's been a, the challenge for Republicans to come around. They, they all have different goals as to what health reform should be for. Right, and I'm gonna ask you, before we go to the audience, about uh, essentially, if you're at the craps table, right, because you're betting, do you bet one in five chance of something passing, I'm gonna hope that it doesn't pass, or do you say, as the president suggested a couple weeks ago, maybe Democrats should come to the table. If the Republicans can't agree, and the president wants reform, maybe the Democrats cut a deal. If you're advising the Democrats, do you tell them to go cut a deal? Evan, I don't prognosticate, generally speaking. Oh, and pish posh. It, what this reminds me of is one of my favorite former HHSC commissioners who, when he was having a hard time making a savings target that he'd been dictated in a budget writer, would say, we're not sure exactly when we're going to reach this savings target, but we will eventually reach it. Could be over a hundred years, right? But I, I think that you know, obviously, there's going to be more legislation amending the ACA, and, and you know, the question for me is, uh, what's in it? Do you and, and, and I think, do you and yours want to roll in crafting that legislation, or do you want to basically do what they've effectively done, which has gone, nope, you own it? I think it will be better legislation if it is bipartisan. Probably, but I, I'm going to jump back. I'm going to just jump back in and say I think this notion that none of us has to be a math whiz to understand that the the average per capita cost of health insurance is going to be less if you leave out the sick people, and and the bottom line is there are dozens, as you know, and you're probably more expert on them than I am, dozens of ways that you can do, uh, design a system that deals with the costs of those people. The hard part, and the part that we are struggling with as a country, is making the decision to do that. 
Uh, do we want to? Do we want 80% of our people to have health care on the cheap at the cost of 20% of our people not, whether they're poor or whether they're sick or both? And and you know we have to make a decision about whether that's the yeah. value we want. And then there are many ways to do it, as every other OECD country can show us. And I know you have a couple of personal favorites. So uh, I am not stuck to one particular way of getting there at all. But I am stuck to getting there, and I'm tired of discussions that never get back to the value that's at the heart of that. You know, why have modern healthcare technology? Why develop it? Why invest in it if your intention is not to share it with everyone? We're going to go to questions. Again, you have buttons in front of you at your place. Please hit push. Uh, and uh, the button says push, and it ought to. We'll see how this how this works. If this works really well, we'll credit the dean, and if it works poorly, we'll Evan, blame Steve Scheibel. Push, push, and hold. Apparently, push and hold. Push. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You want to try? Go, go first. You be the uh, guinea pig. Thank you. Uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. Uh, I want to make uh, one little statement and one correction. Okay. Um, and I would ask you to uh, read a report that we've done of a contract with UT Health. Uh, Who are you? Kevin Moriarty, uh, I head Methodist Healthcare uh, Ministries in San Antonio. We own the largest hospital care system in the United States. I provide health care in 74 counties, and we have the largest philanthropic organization for unfunded patients, probably in Texas. Um, I'm president CEO of that company. And you've got a question for these folks. And the question is this. Um, the uh, UT report, which we uh, funded, which resulted in re uh, release in August of uh, 2016, basically stated that the Medicaid program in, in Texas, as bad as it is, compared to commercial programs adjusted for patients in both places, is about acting the same. And so it's not worse, it's not better, it's about the same for Medicaid patients. And so our Texas program, as bad as it is, is as good as commercial pay for the same types of patients in Texas. And you can read the reports that you take. The other thing that you stated, and I agree, that people waiting for Medicaid in various places you know, die waiting to get care. Unfortunately, two reports about it, you know, one charted by us, one charted by Harvard, uh, said that the one by us went, went out of UT uh, Galveston, said that in Texas, uh, 3,500 to 4,000 people a year who don't have access to health care die. And so uh, for me, uh, it's about performing, okay? I, I got what I heard, and I don't, don't really care whether the private sector does it or the public sector does it. Yeah. It's about reforming and adding. Uh, the population's in, maybe not universal, maybe universal with the private sector. And so, can you talk to the fact that we've got so many things happening here related to patients oh, and clients yeah. that are not yeah. being addressed? One of the biggest problems that we haven't had an opportunity to talk about today, and arguably the biggest obstacle to universal coverage in America, is the fact that hosp the price of hospital care is so high. And I mean the price, not the cost, the price. The prices that hospitals charge in the United States is five times higher for a day in the hospital than it is, it is anywhere in the industrialized world. And the thing is, we're actually much more efficient at getting people in and out of the hospital. So people talk in rooms like this and in centers like this about delivery system reform. We've got to squeeze out all the inefficiency and waste and all the excess volume, uh, unnecessary treatments. Well, guess what? Actually, if you compare the United States to the other advanced economies, we're actually much better at avoiding unnecessary care. The average length of stay in a U.S. hospital is about uh, 4.8 days, according to the OECD. It's 7.7 .7 days in the typical OECD country. So we're three days better in terms of getting people in and out of hospitals more efficiently. The problem is the average day in the hospital costs five times as much as the average day in a Swiss or French or German or Canadian hospital. And that's not because we're doing five times as much stuff. That's because hospitals are charging five times more money for the MRI or for the CAT scan or for the catheterization. And so it's really one of the most important things we have to do in this country is have a real honest conversation with hospital CEOs all over America about the prices that hospitals are charging for the care they deliver and to be more accountable for those prices. And also, by the way, for the enormous amount of consolidation that's going on in hospital systems across the country, including at Seton, where hospitals are buying up other hospitals and using their market power to charge higher prices to private insurers and leaving them no choice 
but to pass those prices on to consumers do, do in the form want, of higher want, premiums. Do you want the government having a conversation with private businesses about what they can charge? I thought you guys hated that. Well, I'd say a couple of things. One, there's a whole chapter in Transcending Obamacare, the, the big health reform plan at freeup.org, on, on how to reduce hospital costs through antitrust. Hospital pro-competitive reforms in which we reduce the government's incentives. The government's creating all sorts of incentives for hospital emergency. ACA in particular is doing this through things like accountable care organizations, the new Medicare uh, uh, CHIP Reauthorization Act. There are lots of regulations that the ACA and other government uh, legislation has put in at the federal level that incentivize more consolidation. So we should move away from that to a system where we actually break up hospital monopolies and encourage, eliminate the restrictions for new entrants to come in and compete. Real free market. Yeah. Right. Uh, Mr. Lava. Does this work? Uh, go ahead, or I'll repeat your question if it does. Hold it. Um, it seems to me that the Affordable Care Act really is, it takes in the whole population because we have a piecemeal system here where we do this for this group and this for that group, and then we have the prices going out of, line, out of sight now. It seems like we're, pr we're pricing ourselves out of medical care and that the insurance companies are at some point gonna to charge too much and employers are gonna drop it completely. Everybody, and everybody's gonna need care. So I was just wondering, don't you think it would be simpler if we had one system of everybody doing the same thing? I mean, you get in the crowd and you ask them, how many people here are on Medicare? And those who raise their hand say, how many people don't like it or have a problem with it? Nobody raises their hand. So it seems to me that right. we can't, affordable care has to be come under control of somebody, and I'm, I'm just wondering if you think that eventually we're just, you're going to have a single payer system anyway. What do you What do you think about single payer? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that in in theory, you know, if if you got to wave your magic wand as Evan warned us about and uh, and start from scratch, that's definitely what you would do. I have no idea. You know, every single. A player in the market that we have now, including the ones that are nominally nonprofit or publicly sponsored, are going to try to keep their market share. Uh, it's 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 not easy or quick uh, to to reform those systems. Uh, but I don't disagree at all uh, with the premise of your question, except for one thing: Medicare doesn't cover eyeglasses, hearing aids, dental care, or long-term care, which are four of the things that I suspect I'm most likely going to need in, in five years when I get that, to that age. And so, and it's only for ten years had a drug benefit. So, um, I think we have some work there. And also, it's important to understand that Medicaid is paying for a whole bunch of the stuff Medicare doesn't cover: uh, two thirds of our nursing home care and all of our care for people with disabilities. Chip, could conservatives get to a place where single payer is attractive? Uh, no. But uh, you got to talk about some of the reasons why, right? I mean, and I'm here because um, I've worked in politics, right? I'm not here because I have a medical degree. I'm not here because yep. I'm a doctor. Um, if I want to talk about Medicare, I have to talk also in terms of the overall cost to the country, right? I mean, right now, we're looking at over $100 trillion in unfunded liabilities in this country. Now, that's, that's why Medicare is so popular. And, that, and that's, that's Medicare and Social Security and everything, right? But I mean, we're talking about serious unfunded liabilities. Right about the $20 trillion of on the books debt that we're already stacking up and mounting up year in, year out. I'm talking about the unfunded liabilities that if we had to write a check right now to pay for all of the promises, that's what we're talking about. It's unsustainable. So we've got to find a way to make it sustainable. And I think, again, credit to Ovik, he's out there with, with some good ideas about some free market solutions within the context of creating a system that works. And I do want to take issue with one other, somebody, I can't remember who it was, said something about, well, uh, not wanting any government involvement whatsoever. My preference, of course, is less government involvement, more competition, more market-oriented solutions. But there is a role for government. I mean, even at just, to start with the one end of the spectrum, at least in contract enforcement, right? I mean, right. there is always some sort of role for government in making that work. And there is a role for safety nets to, to figure it out. But to the question of single payer, uh, I think that single payer is problematic in terms of, of the cost structure. And keep in mind that the country in the United States with 310 million or however many people we have and growing, the number of people in this country, that that's a very different environment to make something work like a Singapore or Switzerland or something like that. And it's, it's more complicated politically and structurally in our federalist system. Yeah. And we have to, it's a lot of work to make it happen. Agnes, we, we have to stop. Okay, we're, 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 we've come to the end here. I apologize for that. Uh, great conversation with these three. Please That's thank Ann Dunkelberg, Ovik Roy, and Chip Roy. Thank you to the Dean and Medical School. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you again. Thanks. Nice thank you, Ann.